So now you've been at this for close to 20 years. How important is discipline to your process? Do you have like a, a set timeline or goal when you sit down to write? If it's a project for hire, I have a legal deadline. Right. <laughs> So. It's great to know that you pay attention to those. <laughs> More people should check that, check out that discipline. Uh, and if it's a spec, mm -hmm. I set my own deadline. And, and discipline is the most important thing of all because that's what pushes you through mm -hmm. whether you're feeling inspiration right. or not. Do you have any rituals built around the, your writing process? Do you listen to music or go to certain locations or kind of use props to write? No, not really. I mean, I do go to different locations. Mm -hmm. What does that do for you? Um, well, this place, the office, actually is really good because it's, um, I think being around other people working creatively sort of mm -hmm. creates its own energy. You know, for many people who saw it by club, you know, they might be wondering, you know, for people that don't understand just the kind of the obstacles in the business, um, you know, why they haven't seen your name on a lot of films since Fight Club. Is it for your type of material, just for writers in general, like how, Fight Club was a, a very positive experience, but what are the kind of obstacles you can run into in, in Hollywood in terms of keeping a consistent flow of work on screen? Well, it, it costs X amount of money to hire me to write a screenplay. And it costs a considerably higher amount of money to produce a feature film. Right. And in addition to which, a lot of things have to line up. Uh, the stars, the director, the studio wanting to make it. Um, so that, in addition to cost, means that Obviously, the amount of films made is going to be far less than the amount of scripts written. Right. So beyond that, I've taken things that are a little bit off the center line, and they've been hard to, right. to make all the stars align, right. basically. Do you find that, the, that um, the films that have the least amount of resistance are kind of like the, the more mediocre projects or the ones that... Um, are more or less like down a familiar track and well, or is not, that cynical? Not always. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily always even say mediocre. I'd mm -hmm. say um, things that feel like a sure bet right. that will connect with a, a large audience probably. Can anything yeah. ever feel like a sure bet? Well, I don't I mean, William Goldman says no one knows anything. So right. That's a good point. <laughs> How did you support yourself before the screenwriting took off? I was various things like a um, journalist, um, a uh, teacher. Did you uh, teach journalism? No, no, no. OK. Uh, just English. Mm -hmm. But that was to high schoolers. Right. Uh, here, in, in fact, the Unified School District, LA. Um, and I was a bartender. I admit it. I was a bartender. No shame in that. <laughs> A lot of character studies right. in that. <laughs> I spilled my guts to many bartenders. <laughs> yeah. Give me like a, the most colorful anecdote having to do with your life pre-screenwriting in terms of your different jobs. Oh, well, I mean, I was working at a dive, dive bar in, the, in North Hollywood, the San Fernando Valley. And one afternoon, hardly anyone was in there. And a very small man comes in. He's old, seems a little frail wearing a fishing cap, and sits down and very quietly orders a crown royal on the rocks. And um, he doesn't really say much, but he seems fairly friendly, but maybe kind of lost in his own thoughts. And there were a few other people there, some at the bar and some at different tables. And the phone rang. And this was such a dive that even though I'd been there four months or so, I didn't know where the phone was in the <laughs> right. bar. And I just had to follow the ring. I, I couldn't believe there was a phone, but I found it. I picked it up. And this very sophisticated British female voice said, is Mr. Peckinpah there? <laughs> and I said, Mr. Peckinpah? Yes, Sam Peckinpah. And so I, I put my hand over the receiver and looked around this bar. I mean, everyone in it, I and mean, I, I couldn't imagine the answer being yes. And I said, um, is, is, is there a Mr. Sam Peckinpah in here? And of course, it was the old man with the fishing cap on. Right. Yeah, I'll, it's me. I'll take it. So I stretched the phone out. And at first, he's really quiet. Well, uh, yeah. And then his voice goes up, 
to a booming scream and a stream of obscenities. <laughs> um, so now you're paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> and then he throws the phone and it lands in the back bar and I hang it up. And of course I realize the timing sucks, but I walk over to him and say, I couldn't help noticing that your name's Sam Peckinpah. He's still steaming right mm -hmm. And so I came in right away with you know, wild bunch straw dogs, various, right. and, and how masterful I thought they were. And that worked. He, he warmed up to me. Mm -hmm. And we started talking. And I asked him specific questions about what were the hard parts of filming this and filming that. And he really enjoyed talking about it a lot. And uh, then he insisted that he buy me a Crown Royal and Rocks. Mm -hmm. And the manager of this bar, who was around, was a real tight person who basically would fire you for drinking on the job. And I said, um, I want to put it in a coffee cup, if you don't mind. And he said, you're having a drink with Sam Peckinpah. Now put it in a real glass. <laughs> well, let's have a drink. So I thought, you know what? He's got a point. Right. So. I filled up both the glasses, we toasted, had a drink, and the manager came in and saw me do that. So I actually got fired over it later, but I always thought that was worth it, That's especially when six months later he was no longer alive. Right, so. wow. So the manager's not a film buff, buff I take it. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't, yeah. Do you find that um, having experiences like that or being in the business for um, a, a long time is a benefit, or are there certain drawbacks to just being at it for, for so long? Well, I think the benefits are building relationships, mm -hmm. you know, around town with producers, studios, directors, right. actors. It's, that's something that grows as you stay in the business. Um, as, as a writer, um, building those relationships, do you find now that you work with a lot of the same executives or producers um, over and over again because you gravitate towards the ones that actually are effective? Um, sometimes, but I also like starting off things with new people mm -hmm. because that's fun too. In terms of the pitching process, like when you go in and just kind of pitch an idea as opposed to writing a spec right. script or doing a rewrite, is that a pain in the ass or do you enjoy that process? And I hate it actually. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I always try to turn every session where they want to bring me in and hear my take right. into a free flowing Exchange. Stream of consciousness <laughs> right. conversation. Mm -hmm. And then it finally gets over with, and everybody realizes that they didn't hear a take, but we all feel like we really are grooving on this idea. Right. And I never wind up doing a pitch, which is what I like to happen every time. Now, why is that so? Why, <laughs> why, I mean, I think I know, but, but why is it a pain in the ass? Why do, you, why do you feel like it's such a, you know, not something you want to indulge in? Well, pitching is really, really classic salesmanship. And unless mm -hmm. you really like being a salesman. I just think it's, it's just not, not something that comes naturally to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have worked up my own system <coughs> excuse me, for what I think a pitch should probably be, and mm -hmm. I've used it before. And this does come from newspaper journalism, where articles are written where the first paragraph, well, I'll do the whole thing as if it were a pitch. Okay. The headline. Mm -hmm. The first paragraph is the entire story. The second paragraph is a repetition of the entire story with the most important details added to it. Mm -hmm. And the third paragraph is the next most important details. And then by the fourth paragraph, you should be getting close to the end of your pitch. And that sort of does a, maybe some of the bigger themes of what it is and then some kind of a capper to get out of it. And I think that structure is probably smart for a pitch. Oh, that's a great, so that's interesting. So the first paragraph of, of your average news story will, will be the whole story, yeah. and then it's elaborated in, in the order that you suggest. Yeah. And when you've had to structure a pitch, not that you in, indulge it a lot, but that's kind of the structure <laughs> you follow? I try to, mm -hmm. yeah, as much as possible. Yeah. How long, I mean, if you were an executive, what would be your tolerance level, or, or when would you lose patience in a pitch of a writer? Well, actually, this is a question I've always wanted to ask you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I've done it, but you, have, but you haven't, but. Right, um, I mean, it's just, uh, I get the feeling that 
no matter what's going on, eyes are starting to yeah. glaze over. I'm like, I'm good with a half an hour. I don't <laughs> mind a half an hour at all. Yeah. I, I feel like that's, that's polite and appropriate. And if it's a great story, I don't mind hearing about it for more than 15 minutes. But I also hear, I hear conventional wisdom is kind of 15, 20 minutes tops. You got to grab them in the, the first, like you were saying about right. the paragraph or whatever. Yeah. But um, I, was, I was telling someone, they go long sometimes too, and you feel like you're a captive audience. And you don't wanna, some people I know can't cut people off. <laughs> and go, I got to go, let's, you know, step it up. And I feel right. like that's, I can't be that, that rude. But um, you really you get terrified when the people walk in with the treatment that's this thick. And then they, they just recite. And right. then you're locked and loaded right. for, the, for the 40 pages. Yeah, that's probably a good 50, between 15 and 30 is probably. Right. Smart. I always get down on people for comparing today to yesterday. I always think it's kind of a cliche in and of itself that, you know, it reminds me of like, Frank Sinatra fans complaining about Elvis in the 50s. Like, that's not music. We had music. I don't know what this is. <laughs> but it is hard to not think that movies are worse today than perhaps in years past in terms of quality. Um, why do you think it's so hard to get a good run of films from every studio every year? Well, I think all the major elements involved in making a film from the studio or the financier to the producer, director, writer, and stars believe they're making a good film, for the most part. Um, the way villains think they're never the bad guy. Right, right, mm -hmm. right, exactly. And then during the shooting, most of them will still continue to believe they're making a good film, and, and then by the end of it, some of them will think they made a good film, if not all of them. Right. Um, so it's all really a subjective thing, unless uh, it's really obviously a huge tentpole movie in which case, maybe the director thinks, I'm going to dazzle everyone and it's going to be a good film that way. Right. It's possible the actors don't think they're doing Shakespeare. Right. But um, another question that really sort of uh, addresses this is, what happens to the pure initial vision between the time mm -hmm. it happens and the end of the film? And I think a lot of that is two things. One is it's the nature of, of, of a, a, a collaborative medium. Right. And then there are probably, you know, pathologically negative things that also can occur right. where people have different ideas of what the finished product is supposed to be, even how it's supposed to be marketed. Mm -hmm. Let's say, for ex example, the um, financier of this filmed interview decided I should wear a purple fright wig <laughs> Right. during the interview, and told the director, they had a conversation, maybe an argument, but the director decided he'd give it a shot, maybe half-heartedly. The director manipulates me in a very clever way into thinking that this will set me apart as an eccentric, right. unusual writer and actually create good PR for me. My vanity responds, and I think, all right, I'm going to do the purple fright wig. Um, you show up, you're going to do your interview questions. Right. Uh, you, you, it's, it, it's hard for you to keep a straight face. You burst <laughs> right. into laughter during the... And during the filming, they get a lot of takes of your bursting into laughter because that's going to work into this right. really well. And me, in the meantime, uh, self-consciously realizing that I don't want to come off as somebody who did it uh, disingenuously, mm -hmm have to play the eccentric and answer straight-faced to all the questions you're asking. So that, against the inner cutting with you laughing in hysterics, right. creates a good comic dynamic of something bizarre. And then um, you start to improvise questions that get more and more personal, psychological, and I start to embellish things about my real life and make them sound ghastly and perverse and sick. And the finished product, is something that some critics say is an abominable exploitation of a mentally unsound person. <laughs> right. And some critics say it's a penetrating view into the mind of an artist. Is it a good interview of Jim Wolves? Right. It depends on who you ask. You know, they market it as come see the freak. Right. It sells a lot. You know. But it wasn't what was originally intended. It wasn't what mm -hmm. was originally intended. Well, it was, but I refused the uh, purple. <laughs> right. 
Um, yeah, that, that's a, a really accurate, actually, analogy of how, how many things can go, can go wrong. It, it almost sounds like it's a wonder when things line up and go <laughs> right. Do you find it's a, it's a small miracle when things can come out of your head and end up on screen 75% looking like what you pictured them to look like? That's a miracle, yeah. I mean, I hope to have it happen. Right. But with Fight Club, it was just very lucky. Are notes difficult to deal with from, from a studio or, or producers? You know, is it just a, yeah. a necessary evil or you don't mind them so much? Um, it varies from job to job, right. place to place. The, the, the sessions that are hard for me to deal with, I think, are a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And they're all sitting around right. and they're all sort of saying their notes. And I realize after a while that like perhaps you when you're hearing the pitch, my eyes are glazing over right. in this case. And um, it's impossible to incorporate all of this stuff. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like, how do you sift through it? Right, it's the committee thing. Yeah, it's the committee thing. And I don't want to project the persona of the dug in, stubborn, contrarian screenwriter who's not listening. So what I try to do at the end of the whole session is say, what a lot of ideas. <laughs> does I mean, that work? <laughs> it does. Mm -hmm. They think it's a compliment. Right. But what I'm really saying is it was just a lot of ideas. Right. And most of them were going to go out the window. <laughs> is your attitude about notes on assignments different than attitudes about notes on something you've generated yourself? Are you do you give them more leeway when it's something they brought to you? I, I probably do. I think it's a little more subconscious, but I probably mm -hmm. do because there's a real possessive feeling about original scripts. Right. What's your biggest fear about being a screenwriter, if, if at all, if you have one thing that still gives you kind of a little bit of anxiety about your chosen profession? What would it be? I get a listing of open writing assignments, and I'm flipping through it, and one of them is a project that I'm writing. <laughs> Right. Is that a recurring nightmare or is it actually happening? It is a real nightmare, mm. yeah. I wake up like, no! Nah! <laughs> and then I realize, oh no, that's not how I'm still the writer. Right. I'm still the writer. No problem. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the biggest fear. And I mean, is, you always want to think you can take it all the way to the right. finish line. How, how dangerous is it in terms of wanting to take something to the finish line? How, how in jeopardy is that just because of the mindset of replacing the writer just to replace the writer, just to say, well, now we can hire this writer, and it'll protect us from being told we didn't do as much for the project as we could have. Can you? Is that what goes on? Uh, I heard. I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, are there any forces working against an honest attempt to take it all the way through? You know, besides just the creative process, or people's egos involved, or do, do politics get involved? I think so. I think so. Um, I don't know if it's as prevalent as it used to be, but mm -hmm. there was a time when. Uh, directors wanted to replace the writer so that there wouldn't be somebody who had a, a pre-standing artistic mm -hmm. connection and stance, so to speak, on it before he, he or she came on. Um, so it was arbitrarily done. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really think that's terrible, you mm -hmm. know, obviously. But um, I think more now maybe creative differences and right. things like that. And is there a, uh, one particular frustrating thing about being a screenwriter that you've learned to deal with or that you feel at all? Well, the, I mean, the real frustrating thing is, as we were talking about before, is, you know, not every screenplay is going to be made into a movie. So right. it, the frustrating thing is, will everything line up on this? You know, right. where is this in the, what temperature is this at the studio? Mm -hmm. um, how active are they? Does it have a champion at the studio? Right. Is somebody is the producer strong enough to push it forward? Right. Will will it get those elements lined up to get that budget and marketing people saying we could market this? Right. So as a uh, as a writer with with your time being precious, those are some of the things you look at in terms of is this a good bet for me to take on? Well, I have to think that way more and more now because I certainly have spent some time writing some right. left of center projects, but I still. I still try to aim for something that's going to give me something interesting. But more and more, the probability of being made is a 
mathematical calculation right. that's going on. <laughs> Do you have a, a particular piece of wisdom that was either told to you or that you can suggest for screenwriters? Don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> what would the small stuff be? Um, if they didn't tell you to change something that's like, I mean, this is just to be silly, right. but the color of the drapes, right. change the color of the drapes, makes them happy. Right. If they tell you to change the character from a man to a woman, right. and that doesn't work, right. those are your big battles. Well, I can back you up on that. I have been in meetings where people come up with their personal little notes that are so important to them that you know, in the macro view of the screenplay, have no bearing at all on anything. It's just <laughs> it's weird what people seize on. Right. Has screenwriting gotten easier for you over time than it, than it was in the beginning, or is it your process is still your process and it's basically remained unchanged? Well, ever since the, the, the successful merging of the intuitive and the analytical, I think it's, it's made it easier for me. Easier doesn't mean easy, though, because right. it's still boot up a computer, stare at an empty file if you haven't started yet, mm -hmm. and come up with something. So right. <laughs> that's always hard. When you're in between projects or kind of coming up with your next idea, what are the things in life that inspire you or just kind of keep you turned on as an artist? Well, I think um, you know, multiple, there's multiple things, like taking trips, whether it's to a big city or out in the woods. Um, I think about people from my, uh, either that I know currently mm -hmm. or people from the past and some of the problems they've encountered that they're either telling me about now or I remember in the past or humorous things. And, you know, keeping up with what's going on in the news and trying to make this all sort of blend together, mm -hmm. fact and fiction and location and, and see if it causes anything to come up. What if I put uh, that guy I knew in grade school who did blah, blah, blah as a cop right. uh, in, from New York, but now he's got to work uh, as a forest ranger or whatever. And then it's just sort of story ideas can sort of explode. That sounds fun because that feels very godlike. Yeah, like just well, taking... uh, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I enjoy that part of right. it. Right, creating a whole universe of people that you're familiar with and putting them right. where you want them. Right, mm -hmm. not only that, I can get revenge on them, <laughs> I can humiliate right. them, and mm -hmm. it's great. Do you think there's anything to the, the, the often voiced um, opinion that people in Hollywood are out of touch with the American mainstream? I mean, coming from, from where you come from, do you feel like you know, the, the, the business out here or the executives or the powers that be are not in touch with you know, the, Amer like the true American culture or, or the American mainstream? Well, the problem is when I go back to Missouri now, they're all immersed in the latest popular culture. Right. Everything, you know, so. So it's kind of, it's, it a, do you think it's a bogus complaint when, when people say that? Um, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of what a writer should be writing, I think it's probably a good idea to, to go from as, as real a place as possible rather than imitate another movie. Right. What, uh, what's upcoming for you? What, are you? what are you working on now? What are you going into? I'm actually doing a production rewrite currently for a horror film called Into the Mirror, mm -hmm. and it's based on a Korean horror film. It's at New Regency. Uh, they'll start shooting a, uh, probably the beginning of September. And I'm doing a substantial change on it. Um, so I'll probably get credit. Uh, it's, it's turning into something pretty exciting, pretty, pretty interesting for a horror film. Oh, great. Is that a genre you enjoy? Uh, I, I found more and more that if, if mm. there's a way to make it um, intelligent and interesting and keep the characters full, mm -hmm. that it's a good, it's a good field to, uh, genre to work in. Uh, I also have a new Regency, Flickr, which was an adaptation. This is a book that you had to take your pearls of ideas out of and then hurl it as far away <laughs> right. from you could. You know, 600 some odd pages set over 20 years, set from 1960 to 1980. Wow. And it's a thriller. That's a, so that's my, a... my joke about it being a thriller for 20, 20 year period. <laughs> but isn't that the guy I saw with a knife outside my window three years ago? Right. Um, that's biting off a lot. It sounds like yeah. that adaptation. So, so uh, Darren Aronofsky's uh, the director attached to it, and we decided right away 
let's take what we like out of it. Right. But it'll be a thriller set now. Right. And a thriller timeline, like two weeks. And right. So you've that, condensed 20 years to two weeks. Well, I wouldn't huh. say I condensed it. I'd right. say that I jettisoned right. a lot of stuff. But it's still, you know, it's still basically about what that book was about, right. which is interesting. And it's sort of a, it's a thriller that's really odd. Right. It has quirky characters and a lot of interesting things about it, mm -hmm. so it was fun to work on. So you're still keeping up your peculiar reputation? Yes, that is a peculiar mm -hmm. script. <laughs> well, good luck with everything. Okay. Thank you so good. much for doing Thank this you. with us. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, please remember to check out our other great interviews in the series. And remember, it's all up to you. The next Written by Credit could be yours. I'm Mike DeLuca.